the negative feedback loops that used to really hold me captive started to shift into these positive self-talk and acknowledgement of my increasing self-work. And so I always like to say that as the subconscious momentum begins to build in your life by doing these little things every day, you have an increase of energy to show up to the world the way that you know you can actually show up. And that was when I never looked back and has really led me to the point where I'm at right now. In order to live an extraordinary and abundant life, you must focus on your internal battle and win within. My name is Randy Wilson and welcome to the Rich Mind Podcast. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. I'm so excited today to bring you the guest that we have on board with us here today. This is going to be a super fun conversation. We were just talking before we hit record, and the stories that we have are similar in relation, meaning uh, a lot of the things I've heard him share with his past and how he's overcome some of those challenges and to really become who he is today and how he is and showing up in life moving forward. It's really inspiring, which is why I invited him on here as a guest here with the show. So today I have with us John Daniel. John is coming to us from Austin, Texas. He is a high-performance executive coach. He helps high-level professionals optimize their fitness, their health, and their mindset to boost their energy, focus, and business success. He's the founder and creator of SimpleSavageFitness.com, where he helps real people get real results. And I love that last piece where he helps real people get real results. And we'll dive into kind of what that is, what that means, his vision for his clients, his business. Uh, obviously he's a fitness professional, but he focuses also on the mindset part of life and business and relationships and how without that, that piece, I mean, it's, it's going to be difficult to achieve the greatness that you truly desire, which is why I'm super excited about this conversation. So without further ado, John, man, welcome to the show. This is going to be a lot of fun. Super excited, Randy. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So I went through, you know, the bullet point list of kind of who you are, where you're from. I mentioned you're down in Austin, Texas, uh, but I would love for you to take a few minutes here and go as deep as, you, as you'd like. Share with everybody you, your story, kind of where you've been, the evolution of who you've become and kind of where you're going. Share with us a little bit about your story. Yeah, of course. And, you know, just to kind of set the stage for everybody listening, you know, I really like to lead with transparency and vulnerability. And so um, just to kind of give you the setting of where I go here, I, I really just like to lead with that. Um, first things first, my name is John Daniel. Like Randy said, I'm a fitness and mindset coach for high level individuals that are really trying to optimize their mind and their body with a focus and mindset, right? If our, our foundation of mindset is not there, then our body cannot meet us to the level of, of our mind. So as far as my story goes, I was really raised in the shadows of addiction, depression, anxiety, through the absence of my biological father. And my early years were really marked by a lot of struggle. Acceptance was a foreign concept to me. And you know, replaced and set instead by a relentless pursuit of the mind and body, which ultimately has led me to the point where I'm at right now. Uh, amidst all of the darkness of my early years, I knew that there was a hope through a passion of sports that provided me with a lot of structure and purpose. And so uh, my, my parents were always pushing me into the sports world. And I knew that at the time as a child, that was the constant distraction that I really needed that kind of sufficed a lot of the pain that I was dealing back at my home. Uh, I was eight years old when the last time I saw my biological father. And uh, I then moved to California with my stepfather and my biological mom. And I ultimately realized, you know, who am I as a person? Where is myself really lying? And through that, that passion in, in sports and um, dedication within that realm of things, I really decided that, you know, a lot of my identity was wrapped up within sports in general. And so wrestling with identity throughout the length of my life has always been very present with myself. I was a collegiate athlete. I wrestled in college at a couple different schools. And after I was done with that collegiate wrestling venture, I found myself battling with a lot of identity crisis within my life. In that post 
graduate world, there was a year where I really went down a very dark path. I banked on a lot of not very healthy coping mechanisms that was influenced by a lot of drugs and alcohol. I found myself teetering on the brink of, you know, self-destruction. And I was just really grappling with the identity of who I was becoming. So quickly coming to realize that I strayed further and further from the peace that I was searching for the more I self-soothed with all of these habitual coping mechanisms. And so when I was reflecting on the darkest parts of my journey, I reached a point where I really didn't want to be alive anymore. It was one night, you know, I was suffocated by the weight of all of these toxic patterns and emotional exhaustion. But what I realized, it was a very big pivotal moment where that despair and that determination to be, you know, what I call being the boss of your life really collided. And from that depths of that despair, I felt as if there was a revitalized spirit that really emerged from within inside me. It was an unwavering commitment to just, you know, I needed to reshape this narrative that I was creating for myself. And if I were to look five years down the road and nothing has changed, what does my life really look like? And I've always had this vision of having a beautiful family with beautiful children. And the things that I was doing in that immediate time of my life were not building or shaping the person that was going to be able to lead a family or lead my children in life that, you know, the way that my stepfather was doing for me. And so, you know, I think the expedition was really propelled by the realization that adversity can be rather than a deterrent, but actually be a catalyst for personal growth and development. And the more I started to understand what that looked like, the first thing that I thought of was, okay, where have I always felt the most confidence? That was in a gym. And so the first step was really going to the gym. Uh, I had embraced my past and understood that the seeds of confidence and high energy through that mind-body alignment was really placed in a gym environment. And so I really took that first step and went into the gym and I really never looked back, you know, fast forward seven years. And I'm really at this place now where I can kind of give my insight of what that origin or origin story really came from and brought me to now to ultimately help other people find that mind body alignment, regardless of really what, what past you have and, and understanding all these things from an and a holistic approach, if you will. Love that. So I want to kind of rewind a little bit and pull that story apart, if that's okay with you. Yes, of course. Okay. So the part of your story, and we talked about this a little bit before we hit record, that resonates with me the most with your, is your sports journey. Meaning, uh, if anybody is familiar or isn't familiar, I'll just briefly share that when I was in through, well, basically my entire uh, young childhood, sports was pushed on me to be the best, to do best, right? So mine was uh, baseball and basketball. And I really wanted to be a, a professional basketball player. That was my dream. I wanted to get paid. I didn't care how. I didn't care how much. I just wanted to get paid to play basketball to say that I was a pro. So I was driven to do as best I could. My physical abilities didn't meet up with my dreams. So I quickly realized that I wasn't going to make it to this uh, perceived outcome that I really wanted for myself. Point being, or the point that I'm trying to make is that my father was relentless with pushing me and not in the nicest way to the point where I started to not enjoy the sport anymore. I wasn't necessarily doing it anymore for the enjoyment of it, for pushing towards these goals and these visions. It was more out of just trying to keep him happy because if when he would go off, fly off the handle uh, and he wasn't physically abusive, he was more verbally abusive to me. Uh, it was, it was, I would do anything I could to avoid that, to be quite honest. So, but I've heard through different listings of your story and that type of thing that you kind of had a similar experience with wrestling. So wrestling was your sport of choice. Uh, but kind of talk to the folks out there that are might be struggling with, they're doing something not for themselves. They're doing something for a family member, whether it's a parent and how challenging that was number one, to discover and realize it. Right. And then. Yeah. And then we'll maybe pick that, you know, move forward with part of that story. But I'm just curious on kind of how that was for you uh, through that, you know, that late teen, maybe early 20s stage of your life. Yeah, of course. And I think that this was a big evolution process for me. Uh, the longer I evolved in that wrestling career, the more I had different revelations of what it was bringing to me. But in terms of the start of it, you know, battling with the fact that my biological father had left me, 
I, as a child, didn't know or couldn't really conceptualize what that meant. And so naturally, I was finding all of these ways to prove myself to my stepfather, to my mom, that I was worthy. And having my stepfather be a, co a past college wrestler, an ex-collegiate athlete, I knew that that was one thing that he really saw as valuable. And it was nothing where he was pressuring me on doing things that I didn't want to do. It was more so from the underlying worthiness that I battled with of proving my worth to him because the last thing I wanted to do was have my stepfather leave me now too. And so I thought that, you know, if I go into a sport that my stepfather was really good at, he would see me as valuable and wouldn't want to leave. And these were things, all revelations that I had going through a lot of serious therapy years down the road that I actually started to be aware about. But that led me to battling with a lot of this worthiness. And even if we are battling with worthiness, when we're put into a situation like I put myself in going to a college where they were defending national champions and I was put into a room of people where I knew my you know level of expertise in that realm of things was not meeting theirs and so it was going to be a battle day in and day out and if you didn't have that deeper reason of what that why is of being there you were going to be hit in the face pretty quick of why you were there and so within that first few months of arriving to that campus, I loved the idea that, you know, I'm in the, I'm on the best recruiting class in the country, back-to-back -back national champs. That looks great. You know, I'm increasing that self-worth by going to the best school in the country. So I'm good there. Well, boy, did I have a rude awakening after that first couple of weeks wrestling with some of the top guys in the entire country. And I was faced with a harsh reality of looking myself in the mirror of John, why are you here? Why are you doing this? Is it really because you want to be a national champion? Or is there a deeper reason for why you were doing this? Mainly because of on paper, it looked that it looked really good that you were going to the best school in the country. And so I battled with a lot of that the first year of being at, at such a, a competitive school. And what I realized through that journey of that first year is I slowly started to rebuild the purpose and the reasons of why I was doing that through the trials and the tribulations and the beatdowns that I was getting every single day. And I slowly started to shift my main focus of worry of going to the school for worthiness in myself, but mainly focused towards how am I improving as a person? And now that I was separated from my parents, I wasn't even able to, you know, go and tell them, hey, I did this or that or this and that, which is what a lot of that self-worthiness was coming from as I was growing up in that sport. And so the more I didn't have that outlet, the more I realized the reasons why I was at that program. And so that slowly started to transition into this reason of I'm doing this because I want to be a better person. I want to be a life champion. Well, in order to be a life champion, you got to do difficult stuff. And I used that as something, you know, and one really positive thing that my stepfather and my biological mother always told me was, you know, if you start something, you're going to finish it. And so I didn't go there to start something and to quit. Didn't matter if it was a deep rooted insecurity of why I went there or not. I said, and I committed to the coach, my family and myself that I started something. So by all means, I was going to finish that thing. And it, you, it was now I can look back on it one of the biggest catalysts to my personal development journey, because I had to ask myself certain questions. The hard questions is why am I here? Why am I doing what I'm doing? And that slowly started to mold the, the longer I was in that program. Didn't necessarily get easier on the beat downs to say the least, but it did get easier in terms of my worthiness and what I was realizing of why I actually was brought to that position. So even that part of the story resonates with mine as well, meaning, so basketball for me, uh, through eighth, ninth grade. So AAU, I don't know if, uh, Amateur Athletic Union, I think is what it stands for. I don't even know if AAU is even around these days. I'm pretty old. If Anyways, <laughs> we won't get into how old I am. But anyways, so this is before all the travel sports that are going on these days, right? I mean, kids can play a sport 24 hours a day, seven days a week, three, you know, 65 days a year if they choose. But AAU was a big thing. I went and played in a national tournament and realized pretty darn quick. It's like, you're talking about getting a beat down. 
you realize really quick where you stack up in the whole scheme of your skill level really darn quick when you're playing with some of the best co- players in the country, not even just your own county or city or it's anyways. So I, <laughs> once again, I can, comp- I just, I know how that felt for me, which I, I can sympathize and realize how that felt for you. So you mentioned earlier, as far as like you came through that experience and you didn't necessarily have an identity or you were a little unsure of your identity, which led you down, you know, looking back in hindsight, right? You can classify things good or bad. It, to me, it's like, it, it's just experiences, right? You learn from them, you gain from them and you move forward. But just curious, once again, because I, I went through that identity crisis for myself, but I'm just curious for your, for you, what was that like? You, you mentioned personal development several times already, which is fantastic because that's what's led me to where we are today having this conversation. But I'm just curious how you navigated that portion of the you know lack of identity worthiness part of the story. Yeah, that was one very difficult thing for people that are trying to understand who they are when something that's been so constant their entire life. I got put into sports when I was five years old. So when I was stripped of that identity, when I was 22, 23 years old, and I didn't have a sport to really match up with that identity, I didn't know what the hell to do. And those kind of like what I touched on before, those habitual coping mechanisms of, of addiction were always lingering alcoholism that was always there. And I had battled with some of that stuff in the off seasons of the sports, but what was always saving me was going back into season and being so dedicated on my craft that I didn't even ever think of it, but I would find myself in the off season slowly getting pulled to that because I wasn't preoccupied with that identity full fledged. And so when that was stripped to me, you know, in totality, and I didn't have that anymore whatsoever, it it was a pretty big identity crisis. And, you know, I was like, okay, well, now I'm just going to go get a job in corporate America. And now I'm just going to be, this is my life. I'm going to be in a cubicle. Well, what's the fire and passion in this? I'm not pursuing anything like I was in college sports. You can imagine in college athletics, you're working out two times a day. You're traveling for tournaments. Uh, It's very high intensity. And so when you take somebody that's used to such a high intensity lifestyle and you throw them into a cubicle, a lot of conversations that you may not know you were willing to have start to have, you start to have with yourself. And so I ultimately started turning towards a lot of drugs and alcohol. I I started um, hanging out with people I shouldn't hang out with. And that process really caught up to me. And there was some bad things that happened. And there was one night where I was living with my parents at the time after I would graduate and I was looking for a place to live. So uh, I was working this corporate job and on the weekends, you know, the best, the highlight of my life at the time was to go and party and go to the bars and meet up with people and distract myself from all the conversations that I was forced to have in that cubicle every single day of the week. And so that outlet became the reason why I was living and you know, there was one day where my parents came down into my room. They're like, John, you know, you're, you're not really who we know you are. And, you know, I, I was, I battled with them about it because obviously I was super defensive of the type of person that I was becoming and I wasn't proud of it. But in that moment, having that come from the people that I knew loved me and that I knew cared for me, I knew that something had to change. And that was the first realization of not drowning that identity loss out with drugs and alcohol because I was faced with people, real people, real people that cared about me and loved me and wanted the best for me when I wasn't caring about myself and wanting the best for myself. And so, you know, that goes, okay, well, what do I do now? Uh, Now that I have that realization, what is the first step in understanding how to go back to that person that I knew I was when I was pursuing all these dreams and visions as a collegiate athlete. Well, I went on to a podcast and, and I started searching up, okay, like how do I rewire my mind? And so Mm -hmm. the first step in this journey was really just the education piece for me of understanding why am I thinking the way that I'm thinking? Am I normal? Is this crazy? Um, 
and the more that I learned about all of these thought processes that I was happening, the more realizations I had. And at the end of the day, I, I listened to this one podcast and I was on a walk and the podcast was like, you know, one of the guests that they had on the first thing that they did to rewire their mind is they went and got cognitive therapy. And so I was like, all right, light bulb went off. If I'm really going to change the person that I am right now, I need to go heal the stuff that whatever this is bringing out of me. Because I know it's not just because wrestling is gone. There's a deeper reason of why I'm, you know, drowning all of these emotions out with drugs and alcohol underlying just the reason of I, I don't have the sport anymore. And so that was my first step. I went and listened to a podcast I went and hired a, a therapist to go through some intensive cognitive therapy and started to unpack all of these things and processes and, and reasons why I was doing the things that I was doing. And, you know, the first thing that the therapist said to me was, well, what are you doing outside of this therapy that's always brought you confidence? Another light bulb went off. I wasn't working out. I wasn't pursuing anything within my mind and my body. And I was like, well, I'm doing nothing. I, I'm working my corporate job. That's what I'm supposed to do since I've graduated. And she goes, John, you know, you can go and do these things, even though you're not a collegiate athlete, you can still go find that mind and body alignment, even though you're not pursuing a national championship. The things that you were getting from that determination, the mind body alignment within those practices. Yeah. From a, an outside perspective that you think may have been because it was a national title. The reality was because you were confident in yourself of what you were doing every single day. So I urge you to go and step in that gym and, you know, maybe go throw some weights around or do something that's going to bring that life back into you. And so uh, I went into a gym and started throwing some weights around, didn't really know what I was doing, but I realized that one day at a time, one rep at a time, that gym became my playground for self exploration. You know, how hard can I push myself? How much stronger can I get? Then after a few weeks of that consistency, something clicked. This was a direct correlation to life and how I perceive and navigate through the challenges that encompass it. And so months went by and as those months turned into years, each workout brought new levels of this self discovery and the negative feedback loops that used to really hold me captive started to shift into these positive self-talk and acknowledgement of my increasing self-work. And so I always like to say that as the subconscious momentum begins to build in your life by doing these little things every day, you have an increase of energy to show up to the world the way that you know you can actually show up. And that was when I never looked back and has really led me to the point where I'm at right now. It's all about that consistency, right? Showing up every day, putting in the reps. I like saying reps, right? Putting in whether you're, and we're talking about weightlifting, right? Or physical, right? So you can talk about physical reps in the gym, but even reps hosting a podcast or whatever, whatever thing you're working towards, it's being consistent, showing up every day, whether you want to or not. I'm not saying you have to show up at a hundred percent because I think we all have bad days, but at the same time, it's still going through the motions of, of making that happen, which that's, that's super cool that you've been able to pull yourself through that. So then a question that I've got is, so I'm going back to my own journey through my own self-discovery of my identity. And I was introduced to personal development through the, the program Lead the Field by Earl Nightingale. And I made the decision when I listened to that program that whatever became, whatever came into my awareness for the next step, right? I didn't, I was so, I've been self-taught my entire life, but I knew that there was something bigger and better for myself out there. I just didn't know how to, I didn't know how to get there. But the decision I made was as a book or a program, it's like you mentioned about going to get some therapy and some help uh, from outside of yourself to get that next step. My, my question is, was that an innate feeling? Did you have the intu intuition to know? Like, how did you discover or realize that all these negative things and thoughts that are going on in your mind, where do we even begin? How did you, how did you come to that conclusion back in the day? Do you remember? I do remember. I remember that having mentors and coaches in my life have always pushed me to having new realizations. And so I knew that at that point in my life, I didn't have those. So I didn't have anyone to look up to. I didn't have anyone to push me in the direction that I was trying to go. And so what I did 
quite literally is I took all of the years of experience of having coaches and what the framework that they had given me to the path of success. And I just took that and implemented it into the current challenge that I was facing right then and right there. And so if that next mentor or coach, in this case, a therapist was going to give me the roadmap and the tools to become that next best version of myself, doesn't matter how hard it was going to be. I was going to do it. And I've always been that way. Um, if you give me something to do and there's going to be an end goal and my goal is to complete that task or to complete that thing, it doesn't matter how hard or difficult that task is going to be. As long as it's proven to work, I'm going to put in the work every single day to get that. And so I think it came with, um, it was coupled with a lot of the de determination that I had had from previous, you know, ventures within my college ath athletics world, but also the fact that I could use the resources that were available to me, I just had to go find those right resources that were pushing me into that level of growth that I was trying to seek. So you become aware, at least that's been my experience, right? You start seeing things differently when you start working towards a different outcome that you may not even know what's possible. But at the same time, if you have the courage to step into those awarenesses, that's where you can start putting in your reps and start getting towards this outcome or this life that you're trying to work towards. So let's, I love that. So thank you so far for going yeah into that part of the story. Cause that to me is like, that's the gold part, right? That's where, where you've been. So let's fast forward a little bit to you've become aware you've made some choices. Uh, you've mentioned a couple of times about being in the corporate world, but now obviously you're an entrepreneur out there trying to help and serve clients, uh, in a fitness, uh, facility or, you know what I mean? Through your, through your fitness programs, talk about how you, you took all of that adversity, right? You made some changes, you made some different mindset shifts, I believe. And you were out there in Den Denver, Colorado at the time, or in the Denver area. And now you're not, I mean, kind of bridge that gap. Like how did you go from making a few decisions, becoming aware, doing some self-education to start taking the steps to where you are today? Yeah. So I would say, like you mentioned, the awareness piece is the first piece of everything. If we're going to change what we're, what we're going to do. Um, I always say, look at yourself in the mirror. And if there's a lot of fog in that mirror, it looks like you really need to start clearing some stuff up. And that first look in the mirror that I had at myself after my parents came down to my room and said, you know, we can't really see the real John anymore. I had to look at myself in the mirror. So I said, so I think the first part is look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, do I like what I see? And obviously that doesn't only mean from a physical standpoint, but that means from a mental standpoint of where I'm at, where I'm currently at right now, the habits that I have, the things that I'm doing every single day, am I proud of what this is creating? And so that was the first piece. I, Definitely experimented with a lot of side hustles in attempt to break free from a soul draining occupation. I would say I, I really did have a profound revelation. The synergy that I had in my mind and body alignment with going to that gym every single day as I was meeting with the therapist, coupled with that consistency in the gym, it really ignited me to have awareness in what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And so that was where I started to open new doors of opportunity. And so again, I, I started multiple side hustles trying to break free of that occupation. But what I realized, one of my mentors asked me a question that was super imperative towards why I'm actually in Austin, Texas now. And he said, are you surrounding yourself by people that have the similar vision that you have? Mm. And I was looking around my environment and nothing against my parents or my you know, past friend group or anything like that. But what I realized was nobody had been pursuing the things that I wanted to pursue in my life. And so within a week of having that conversation with my business mentor, I took a flight to Austin, Texas, because I knew that that place was a big hub for entrepreneurs that were all young and hungry and pursuing their, their visions. And so I took a weekend trip to Austin, Texas and Within the first 30 minutes of landing, I knew that this place had a different energy, a different vibe to it. I was almost freeing myself of what those past memories were that I had created in Colorado and allowing me to step into this new identity that I really wanted to create. And there's actually been studies done 
that, you know, putting yourself, injecting yourself into a new community or environment allows you to build a new identity that much easier. And so having maybe a little bit of that in my subconscious mind was pushing me towards Austin a little bit as well. And after the weekend was done, I looked at a few apartments. I came back home. I was like, mom and dad, I'm going to be moving to Austin, Texas here in the next month. And they're like, okay, you know, they've always been in support of whatever I want to do, which is I'm super grateful for. And so they said, you know, best of luck and really never, never looked back. Love that too. So the, the thoughts that are going to my mind, I'm thinking of that listener out there is thinking, okay, that sounds great, but how in the world can you get yourself enough courage and enough belief in yourself? So you mentioned this, the word that I like to use is associations, meaning it's the people that you surround yourself with. You will become the average of the five people you hang around with most. I think that's a Jim Rohn quote from back in the day. I've tried to live by that. And it's, I don't like placing terms of good or bad on, on people or situations or anything like that. It's just a different way of looking at life. But the, so then I'm just thinking, how in the world did you go from having that conversation about your associations to, oh, did you say a week? Within a week of, of flying out to Austin, it's like, I'm gone. I'm out. It's like you saw this bigger vision for yourself. Kind of take me through that, that decision-making process. Maybe help some, encourage some folks out there that are like, okay, I would really like to do that too, but I don't even know where to begin. Just can you kind of go a little bit deeper in that one? Totally. So let, we got to reverse engineer it first. We have to say, what is the person that I'm trying to become? What characteristics does that person have? What do they do on a day-to-day -day basis? What types of people do they surround themselves by? And then you reverse engineer it by looking at where you're currently at in your life right now. What kind of people are you surrounding yourself by? What types of habits do you currently have? And then you go and start to look for those things. And it may not be as quickly as mine, right? But the more you start to search for those things, the more those things are going to be present in your life. And that was really the biggest catalyst of just understanding, okay, where am I currently at? Where am I currently surrounding myself by? Where are the people that are having that vision that I currently have? And how can I get around those people? And so whether that's moving to a different state, maybe it's not that extensive, maybe it's moving to a different town, or maybe it's just finding a different friend group. Asking certain questions, one of the biggest things that I allowed myself, for example, within my friend group is I started talking about my vision. I started talking about my goals. And the first signal that those people were not in alignment with that is they started talking negatively about my vision and about my goals and started pulling me away from that. So I would say as a starting point, if you are somebody that is in an environment that cannot talk about those deep desires and dreams, then that is your first signal that something needs to change within that environment. And to be quite frank with you, it's not easy because a lot of the times you grew up with those people. A lot of the times you love those people just like I do. And I had to ask myself one question, how sick and tired am I of being sick and tired? And you've probably heard that before. You know, if you were to fast forward five years from this point right now in your life, what does that look like for you? And get real deep on what that vision looks like because a lot of the times you're not going to like that answer. So you can use that as your fuel to get the courage, to get the momentum, to push you into wherever you're trying to go or surround yourself by the people that you're trying to surround yourself by. And the more you bring that to your cognitive mind of if I fast forward five years down the road and nothing's changed, what kind of person has that created? A lot of the times that'll be enough motivation to do something different. Yes. That's all I'm going to say to that. Yes. Rewind that folks. That was, that was wisdom right there. That's fantastic. So let's fast forward even a little bit further. So now we've gone, we've had the challenges and adversity through the, your college experience. You've had these epiphanies as far as discovering kind of who you are, discovering who your identity is. Now we're in Austin, Texas. Now we're starting a new life, right? We're trying to branch out into this entrepreneurial world. Uh, talk about that. Talk about that experience of moving out there, launching a business, tapping into who you're meant to be. It's, it's, you've mentioned about getting into the gym and discovering that you love the, the back and forth with 
throwing weights around or, or right, becoming more uh, of a fitness person. And then now you're helping high level professionals do the exact same thing. Let's, let's dive into that part of the story. Yep. So one of the first things that I did when I landed in Austin is I started to look for community. And one of the cool parts about Austin is they have a very active fitness community scene here. And so they're, they're constantly having networking events. They're constantly having, you know, fitness events, all these things. And it was funny because when my first mentor has told me, he goes, well, what is something that you can create if you're wanting, you're starting all these side hustles, John, real estate wasn't the thing. Day trading wasn't the thing. Affiliate marketing wasn't the thing. Like, what is something that you can do every single day that you're fired up to talk about that you, for one, know a lot about? And two, that people actually value you in. And that was one thing that I really went to my core and saying, wow, well, health and fitness has always been the catalyst of my life. We live in the digital world. So who's to say that I can't build a business around that? And then the question became, well, what kind of people do I resonate with the most? What kind of people can I really help with the most? And considering that you can usually help the people that are like yourself, I knew that I was a high level performer, a high level achiever. And so I started talking and, you know, planting seeds with a lot of these high level achievers that I knew saying, you know, Hey, do you have alignment within your mind and body? And they're like, no, but I, I tend to put my health and fitness on the back burner when my business is taking a priority. And then we started to bridge this gap between, well, when your mind and your body is in alignment, you actually have more mental capacity and confidence that actually reflects in your business growth. And so some cool realizations started to happen with that. And then that propelled me towards the lifelong mission that I currently have, which is help as many high level professionals as possible, water those seeds that are buried deep down within themselves and guide them towards that self mastery and understanding that true power behind the mind and body alignment like I have achieved in my life and understanding that if business is the main focus, if being a high achiever is the main focus, well, think about high, how high, more high of achiever you can be when you have that mind and body alignment and how much more revenue can actually be generated from that business when you're confident in yourself, when you have high energy, when people can actually look at you as a true leader when you're walking the talk. So when they come to you, I'm just imagining, so high performers, right? They're successful in whatever they're doing, whether it's, I assume it's probably corporate, but then it's also within their own businesses as well. So they've achieved great in their exterior 3D world, but they might not be as fulfilled in their mental capacities or even obviously like we're talking about from the physical standpoint. What are the the main things you see, it's like you, you, you see it all the time. Like you get approached by a potential client or a potential customer and you're like, yeah, this person, number one is going to do well with what I have to provide. But can you think of any like one trade or one thing you see common with the folks that come to you looking for some help? Yeah, totally. And I will answer that with one struggle that I see every single day with a lot of these high achievers is, and it's something that I struggled with when I started as well. And it really goes back to that pivotal question that initiated the whole transformative transformative process for me, which was, do I like what I see in the mirror? And what I realized, I constantly gave myself the excuse that I didn't have the time mm. to transform the person that I wanted to become. And that was just an excuse because it was easier to say that I didn't have the time. So with only 24 hours in a day, you must optimize those habits, those rituals, those routines, and the time that you have and the constraints that inhibit you from moving the needle in that mind and that body alignment. So I would say that time management is one of the biggest things that I see across the board with people that tend to put their health and their fitness on the back seat or on the back burner, right? So through prioritization and, and boundaries, you can carve out the necessary time for self-care and personal development by identifying your most important tasks and identifying, you know, maybe we allocate this dedicated time for a meditation or reflection or exercise, which you can then optimize your daily schedule to enhance both your physical, 
your mental and your business well-being. And so just setting these clear boundaries in your life, which we can all do, is going to maximize your time and also your energy. So go into the time piece. So I think a lot of people listening will be the, because I'm, I'm the same way, right? So you're going to help answer a question for me because you're right. If we're out here achieving, it's hard to cut yourself away from achieving to do that self-care. You mentioned self-care, right? The personal development piece, which is the mindset, but then also obviously the physical piece. Can you give us a little bit of wisdom in terms of realistically, how much time does it take to do and to see some results where, like you said, you can look in the mirror and begin feeling pretty confident about yourself. Do you have a, I know it's not cookie cutter. I get that. Everybody's different, right? Which is why working with somebody like you is so valuable, but is there just kind of like high level thoughts on as far as how much time is required to see some major results? Of course. And it all stands, it all comes down to starting with point A, where we're currently at, which is exactly what I do in all of my programs. It's not a cookie cutter approach. It's meeting you where you're currently at because we can start to see progress that day for whatever point A is. So for example, if I have a client that's been sedentary for the past five years, is killing it in their business and you know, killing it in all these other areas of their life, but they haven't really moved their body at all. Well, that point A might be, let's go take a 30 minute walk outside today and let's focus on that today. And then let's reconnect and see what that did for you in that day. That is going to bring a lot of mental clarity, a lot of, you know, aside from what that's doing for the physical body aspect of things, this is going to bring a lot of alignment and clarity within our mind. And so setting clear boundaries, I'll kind of give you this little nugget of what that really looks like in seeing this progress is we have to set clear boundaries that are going to maximize our time and our energy. So the way we can do this is we can learn to say no to activities and commitments that do not align with our goals and our values, which allows you to focus on what truly matters. And so if we understand what success looks like for us, maybe it's losing 10 pounds in 30 days. Maybe it's just going on that one walk in this next week because we've been sedentary for the past five years. So we can really scale that back so that it's attainable for each individual, depending on where they're at in that journey, right? But by establishing these boundaries, around your time and your resources, you can then create a supportive environment that fosters growth and success in both your personal and your professional life. Because as you start to see these synchronicities and making that first initial step, you may not see it on the scale that first day, but I, I will tell you, you will start to see it in your mind. And now naturally, that is going to be radiated out into the world and people start to pick up on that. And so if you're a high achiever, there's a lot of the times where people are looking up to you, whether that's a being a high achiever within your family dynamic, having children look up to you, or you're a high achiever within your work environment. It's crazy to see that one walk in that first day, you're naturally radiating this new level of energy, which is building that subconscious momentum on the back end. So in order to see success, we just have to understand, all right, where are we currently at right now? And what's one thing that we can do today that's not necessarily going to be losing five pounds, but something that's going to be moving the needle on what that end goal really is. The whole idea of, of being whatever percentage, it's a very small number, right? So you put a percentage on it, but just a little bit better each day, right? And just keep stacking those wins and stacking those wins. So we talked about it earlier as far as uh, the ability to, to be disciplined, to take the reps, right? We talked about that through your part of the story, but then, so I would like you to kind of dig into the, uh, the importance of having the discipline to keep going through the process, right? Being consistent. Consistent is the word that I was trying to come up with there. But then also the piece of accountability, having someone and why it's so important to have a function of a support piece to help you along that journey. Because as we mentioned, you're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days, but it's a matter of just being consistent. Talk about that. Talk about the consistency with accountability. So... Of course. And I think the first thing that comes to mind with consistency is a lot of people confuse the word consistency with motivation, that you have to be constantly motivated in order to be consistent in something. And what I say is motivation is total BS. You can only be motivated for a single certain amount of time, which can actually, yes, get you to go do the thing that you want to be consistent in. But if we are not understanding 
the deep reasons of why we're doing something, we will never be able to stay consistent in. So kind of backtracking into what my story was when I went into a college program where all of these people were beating the crap out of me every single day. I was not going to be able to be consistent with showing up every day if I didn't get down to the nitty gritty of why I was doing what I was doing. And so we have to understand, we have to dig deep on, okay, what are we trying to accomplish? Now we ask ourselves the second question is, why am I really trying to accomplish this thing? Because congruency is so powerful. If you don't know and you're not congruent in why you're doing the things that you're trying to do, you're never going to be able to stay consistent in those things. So I always say, if you're trying to be consistent in something, start asking yourself these questions. What are the real reasons of why I'm trying to do this? And I always say, write that onto a piece of paper because the more you can be aware of those real reasons of why, you would be surprised on how much more consistent you actually end up doing the thing because that's in your cognitive mind now. And so that would be the first starting point of being consistent in something is getting deep on that reason of why we're doing it. Love it. So then being accountable to someone or something kind of goes along with that as well. Having a coach, having a support staff. We talked about associations a little bit earlier. Talk about the importance of that. It, obviously it's helped you, right? You've went and, and sought help with coaches. Anyways, talk about the importance of that. Yeah. I mean, it was a cool thing to experience when I went to my therapist for the first th time because I hadn't had a, a coach, if you will, since that experience. And so I was kind of viewing it in the same light as somebody that's giving me advice on how to take control of my life again. And what I realized is, okay, well, I've leveled up in all these other areas of my life with coaches. And so why is that the reason? And I asked that to my therapist. And she, and I was always talking down to myself. Like I was so upset that I couldn't hold myself accountable for the things that I really did want to change. I wanted to change these things. So why couldn't I hold myself accountable to it? And she kind of relayed back to me something that completely changed my perspective on why having a coach or an accountability partner is such a good thing. A lot of the times we don't prioritize our own needs we prioritize other people's needs and mm. other people's wants. So if we can tell somebody, hey, I'm going to do this for a lot of the times, if you think about it, when we're showing up for a meeting, right? If we're super anxious about being late because other people are relying on us. Well, if that meeting was just for ourselves, a lot of the times, you know, we'll give us some slack. If we're five minutes late, it's okay. It's ours. 10 minutes late, it's okay. It's on us. But if somebody is relying on us, we are making sure that we're going to be on time. And so if we can use that understanding and implement certain metrics within our life around parameters that we're trying to level up in, for example, your health and your fitness, we can schedule out your workouts. We can schedule out your meals and subconsciously you're going to do those more because you are telling somebody, hey, I'm going to do this because I've told you I'm going to do it. And so it's a weird concept to think about but what's cool about this is the more you do that and have an accountability partner, naturally, the more that habit is building and ingraining in, in your subconscious mind. So the more consistent you can actually be for it on yourself. And so I think the importance of having an accountability partner or coach in general is so imperative to this growth because we don't have to look at it as a bad thing like, oh, I need this person to change me. It's more so just putting a tool in place that's allowing you to do more for yourself. And then the more you do that while also communicating with a support partner, naturally you're going to be building that support system within yourself. That's going to be sustainable. And then you won't even need me as a coach, or then I won't even need somebody as a coach because that's the whole end goal here, right? Is sustainable growth. And so if we can find something to hold you accountable, but something that can hold you accountable to yourself in the long term. That is where the real beauty comes in play with having a coach or a support system. It's a true partnership. You, you exactly. mentioned being a partnership, right? So I've heard you say in other places where you, you want clients or folks, prospective clients to come to you and you're the last person they look to as far as their, their health. 
You're the last stop on their journey of achieving their goals. So if someone's listening out there and can you, so obviously they need to get a hold of you. That's number one. And we'll go into detail as far as how to do that here very shortly. But at the same time, is there, you mentioned about somebody that may be a little sedentary, meaning they're not as active as they'd like. I'm not going to lie. I'm used to be more active than I am today and I need to get back at it. I really do, but I'm not unable to do a lot of things. So it's like, I'm in between if that, I don't know how to explain that even a little bit better. But anyways, the point, the question I'm trying to ask is, is there just something else that you can suggest? Some, you mentioned about a walk, um, something else you, you leave with a client that is coming to you that is interested in some accountability. Obviously they're a high achiever in their life. They really don't even know where to begin. Any ideas, any, some thoughts to leave with some of the folks here today? Yeah, definitely. When we think about what our lives look like in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, depending on where your age is, a lot of the times I think about, I want to be able to hold my children. I want to be able to hold my grandchildren. I want to be able to carry my groceries in from the car when I'm 75 years old. So when we start to talk about what makes that possible, naturally, there's thousands of results that are going to pop up on YouTube or on the web, right? And that can be very overwhelming. And so if we just have an understanding that doing resistance training is going to build the bone structure, it's going to build the muscles that are going to allow us to then do the things that I just mentioned 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, it doesn't matter necessarily having a 200 pound deadlift. It doesn't matter um, running a marathon. What it matters is, are you just going in and picking up some weight and putting it down? And at the end of the day, if you're doing that once, twice, three, four, five times a week, your body is going to respond accordingly and you're going to start to build that muscle. And then that's really where I come into play. If you have and need some direction on what that really looks like and the type of roadmap that's going to give you that success or that vision that you have in your mind, for some people, it's losing 10 pounds. For some people, it's building more muscle. For some people, it's just sustainable health, like I mentioned. Well, we can integrate something into your lifestyle, your routine, that's going to allow you to not be overstimulated by the thousands of results that's going to be popping up on YouTube or on Google, right? So it's just thinking about what do we want? If we want sustainable health, great. Let's go and find something that's going to build that sustainable health. If we want to build muscle, okay, we know that resistance training is going to build that muscle. So picking up the weights and putting them down is going to build that muscle. Yes, the other side of the coin is the nutrient side of things, right? We need to make sure that we're eating our protein. We need to make sure that we understand the more muscle that we have in our bodies naturally we are going to be burning more fat at rest. And so if we start to have mindfulness awareness around these things, it gets a, let, a lot less resistant in actually making that first step. Yes. And so that's where I need to begin implementing a lot of those things in my own personal life. And so folks, if you're out there listening and thinking the exact same things, you're in the right place because John obviously is a wealth of wisdom. He's had a ton of experience in life. He's helping people achieve great things, not only just in their physical form, but obviously it translates over into their businesses as well, which is super cool, which is why when we first had the opportunity to connect, I knew that we were going to have a great conversation, which it absolutely has been. So John, if, if folks are out there, so one question I had then is with your coaching and your, um, your fitness training you're online. So it doesn't have, you don't have to be in Austin, Texas to get the benefits of what you have to offer. Is that true? Correct. Yep. We're global. Global. I love that. That's the beauty of the internet. We can be anywhere at any time. So take a few minutes then. And you've obviously shared a ton of wisdom with as far as, you know, helping people get started and where to begin and some accountability and just a lot of the, the things we discussed here today. But if people are out there thinking, okay, I need to get John on my team. I need to partner with him to figure out how I can get beyond this mess. I don't even know how else to put it, right? Just this, this sedentary life that you said that earlier, and that kind of resonated with me. I need to get moving. I need to start moving that needle in terms of my health, which is going to translate into better wealth potentially, right? With a better business, with better relationships. 
where can people learn more about you to get a partnership with you, right? To get you on your team. What's the best place? Yeah, a couple different places. I'm primarily on Instagram at only John Daniel. I'm also on LinkedIn. A lot of my value is sourced from that platform as well, considering that I work with a lot of high level professionals. So LinkedIn, I'm also, you can visit me at www.sitebullsavagefitness.com slash home. Um, but other than that, you know, I think those are the three main platforms that you can reach out to me and we can start to get a game plan in place of what that first off vision looks like for you and really what that roadmap can, can look like for you. So folks, take him up on that. Reach out to John and get connected. Uh, the physical piece of life is, it's to me, it kind of comes and goes, which is unfortunate for myself. I'm speaking for myself at this point, right? You kind of put it on the back burner. You're active, right? You're busy. Uh, life, business, family. And you start to think and realize as you get older that, man, I really need to start paying attention to what's going on uh, in my physical body. Having somebody like John as a partner to help you have that vision of where you want to go, where do you want to become? Bridging that gap, imp implementing a lot of the mindset pieces along with the physical pieces can really help you really achieve a life that you really, you're dreaming of, right? And so take his experiences and realize that you are capable of doing so much more. Uh, reach out to John. We'll have definitely have all the links in the show notes, uh, anywhere you can and reach him, connect with him. And I encourage you to do that because it could definitely be something that can make 2024 and beyond better than you can ever imagine. So John, man, I appreciate you opening up as much as you did, sharing as much wisdom as you did, going as deep as you did with your stories, being vulnerable. That's uh that's where the wisdom is, in my opinion. And hopefully the folks listening can uh, take the stories that you've shared, think about them in their own life, right? And try to bridge and figure out what do they want? What is it that they truly want? And if part of that is becoming healthy, becoming physically strong and capable, they're going to reach out to you, man. So, but thanks. I appreciate you coming on the show. I appreciate you, Randy. Thanks so much. Absolutely. So folks go out there, have a fantastic day. Focus on being great. Uh, start taking your fitness into a little bit of a higher, higher priority, right? Start realizing that that is just as important as your balance sheets, as your family relationships, all the stuff that we are focusing on your health and fitness is just as important. And I need to get more focused with it as of in my life as well. So I'm going to definitely do that. So go out there, as I mentioned, focus on being great. Have a fantastic day. I look forward to bringing back the next guest to you again very soon. Until then, bye now. Thank you for joining me on the Rich Mind Podcast. And remember, your external world is a reflection of what's going on inside of you. So focus every day on that internal battle and win within. Until next time, my friends.